My name is Ludwig Schleffli. I am a Swiss geometer. I live during the 19th century and I'm going to open the door to the fourth dimension for you. Even if I say so myself, I was a visionary. I was one of the very first to understand that spaces with a high number of dimensions really exist and that their geometry can be studied. If flat creatures living in a plane can understand three-dimensional polyhedra, then why shouldn't we understand polyhedra in dimension four? One of my main achievements was to describe all regular polyhedra in dimension four. What is the fourth dimension? A lot has been written on the subject. Science fiction writers never tire of talking about it. I'm going to explain things on the blackboard. You will see that this blackboard has a bit of magic about it. What's important is to prepare yourself to forget about the world which is familiar to us and to imagine a new world that our eyes and our senses have no direct access to. We'll have to be smart, just like the lizards were before. I'm going to climb on the top of a viewpoint that unfortunately you cannot see. And I'll try to describe what I see from there. But before we begin, I'll draw a straight line on the board. Let me just mark the origin here. Each point on this line can be located by its distance from the origin, with a minus sign if it is on the left, and a plus sign if it is on the right. Usually the number is denoted by x and is called the abscissa. Since the position of a point on a line can be described by a single number, we say that the line has dimension 1. Now I draw a second axis perpendicular to the first one. Each point in the blackboard plane is now completely described by two numbers usually denoted x and y, the abscissa and the ordinate. The plane has dimension 2. If you had to explain to some being living on a line what it is to be a point in the plane that is unknown to him, you could simply say a point in the plane is just a pair of numbers. Let's go to the third dimension. The chalk now writes in the air and draws a third axis perpendicular to the two previous ones. A point in space is described by three numbers x, y and z. One could say to the reptiles that are curious to know about our world a point in space is just three numbers. Let's go to the fourth dimension. One could try and draw a fourth axis perpendicular to the others, but that's impossible. So we have to do something else instead. Of course we might just say that a point in the fourth dimension is nothing other than four numbers, x, y, z, t. That doesn't help us a lot. In spite of the difficulties, we are going to try and get a feeling for this geometry. As a first attempt at understanding, we shall proceed by analogy. Here is a segment and an equilateral triangle. And finally, a regular tetrahedron. Our magical blackboard enables us to draw in space. How can we keep this up in four dimensions? Observe that the segment, the triangle and the tetrahedron have two, three 
and four vertices respectively. Therefore, we can try to continue with five vertices. Let's go then. For the segment, the triangle or the tetrahedron, an edge connects each pair of vertices. So we have to connect the five vertices in pairs. We count one edge, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten edges. In the tetrahedron, there is a triangular face for each triple of vertices. We proceed in the same way, which gives us two, three, ten faces. But if we keep going, by analogy, we have to add a tetrahedral face for each four-tuple of vertices. There are five of them. That's it. We constructed our four-dimensional object. We'll call this the simplex. Let's spin it around in space a little, as we did with the tetrahedron. Of course, you have to imagine the simplex spinning in a four-dimensional space. What you see is only its projection on the blackboard. Touch complicated is that faces get tangled and they can cross each other. Well, some experience is required to be able to see in dimension four. We're going to take the simplex, which is in four-dimensional space, and move it gradually so that different cross-sections of it meet our three-dimensional space. In the same way that reptiles could see a polygon appearing and disappearing, we will see a three-dimensional polyhedron which appears, changes shape, and then vanishes. Here is the simplex passing through our three-dimensional space. We're now going to meet more four-dimensional polyhedra, passing through our own three-dimensional world. Here is the hypercube, a member of the family that starts with the segment and continues up through the square and the cube. It has to be said that getting a feeling for the geometry from the slice method like this is rather tricky. I discovered the analogues of the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. They have complicated names, but I'll just call them 120 cell and 600 cell, since the former has 120 faces and the latter 600. Look at the 120 cell. It's just passing through our space. And now here's the 600 cell. Of course, when I say that a four-dimensional polyhedron has 600 faces, I mean three-dimensional faces. These 600 faces are 600 tetrahedra. As for the 120 cell, it consists of 120 dodecahedra. In a minute, we'll see how we can get to know them better. To observe these four-dimensional objects, with our three-dimensional eyes, we can look at their shadows. The objects are still in four space, but they are projected on our three space, exactly like a painter might project a landscape onto his canvas. We've already done just this with the simplex. Here is the hypercube. Of course, it's spinning in space, so that we can appreciate all the details. Notice, for instance, that the hypercube has 16 vertices. Here's a little newcomer. It's the most beautiful of my discoveries. An object that I call the 24 cell. It has absolutely no analogue in dimension 3. It's a purely four-dimensional creature. 
I'm very proud of my discovery. Look how wonderful it is. 24 vertices, 96 edges, 96 triangles and 24 octahedra. A real little gem. Here is the shadow of the 120 cell, in all its majesty. A rather complicated majesty, you have to agree. Let's get inside and have a look at its structure. Look. Six hundred vertices. One thousand two hundred edges. Four edges start at each vertex, a completely regular structure. All vertices, all edges play the same role. It's a pity that the projection breaks the symmetry. Let's work your imagination a little. Imagine the object in four space, in which a huge group of rotations permutes all these vertices and edges. The champion is the 600 cell, like a gigantic macromolecule with its 720 edges and 120 vertices, and 12 edges starting from each vertex. Our exploration of four-dimensional polyhedra won't stop here, as their stereographic projections are bound to give us a better feeling for the geometry.